Okay, I think uh, it's the top of the hour, so we might as well go ahead and get started. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome back to Vancouver, uh, Dr. Guinevere Lee, and who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Weill Cornell uh, Medical School in Manhattan. And she's going to talk to us today about do HIV strains matter in the context of cure research? So Gwen, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dana, for inviting me to do this. Um, it's a, I saw a lot of, see a lot of her names in, in the audience. And thank you for joining. Um, it's my pleasure to give this talk. Let me share my screen. So I'm currently in New York. Um, so my institute right now is Wild Cornell Medicine, but um, let me actually tell you a little bit about my history. So I did my undergrad, my master's and my PhD and my home, my family is in Vancouver. And so I'm a UBC alumni. I, when I was in UBC, I did HIV drug resistance genotyping um, with Dr. Richard Harrigan, who was at that time um, a member of the Center for Blood Research. And so I actually presented, um, my last presentation at UBC was actually a CBR presentation. And so I'm very, very happy to be back. Um, so after my PhD in, uh, in Dr. Richard Harrigan's lab, I moved to the Reagan Institute in Boston where I applied the genotypic, the HIV deep sequencing skills and looking at drug resistance, looking at bioinformatics of the virus. I apply these skills on a project that looks at HIV persistence. So HIV is a virus that persists in a host body. And so after my postdoctoral fellowship at the Reagan Institute, I moved, um, I was recruited to Weill Cornell Medicine um, under a faculty mentor, Brad Jones, who's also Canadian. And so, we kind of have this, um, we kind of built a lab group in the Cornell Department of Medicine that focused very much on HIV research. And in the past year, we actually get a good, a pretty good grant from the NIH to fund our study on um, trying to find a cure for HIV. And this is um, called a UM1 grant. So I was actually digging into my computer and I found that, so this is my last presentation um, at CVR. Um, at the time I talk about the, prevale um, the prevalence and treatment impacts of, again, HIV, different HIV strains and subtypes in Uganda. And this was back seven years ago. So it, it's very, very nice to be here. Um, that was April, it was similar time. So the Norman Bethune Symposium, um, I used to attend this every year. So good times. All right, so currently um, I'm running my own lab at the Wild Cornell Medicine. So I'm located in Manhattan, New York. The overarching theme of my lab is to understand HIV inter and intrahost genetic diversity and its impact on, on treatment and disease outcome. The bottom line is HIV is a crazily genetically diverse virus. Um, its mutation rate is minifold higher than uh, lockfold actually, higher than SARS-CoV-2. And so we are dealing with a lot of point mutations, um, single base substitution mutations, a lot of indels, a lot of genome truncations, inversions. So all of these have impacts on the virus virulence, pathogenesis, um, and the infected individual's disease outcome. There are a few branch of my research. Um, first and foremost, um, this is my home comfort zone. I've done this since my PhD thesis time. Um, I study HIV subtypes. I look at non-subtype B HIV reservoir and persistence. I look at drug resistance in different HIV subtypes. So there are different, many, many different HIV strains, just like how we have Delta and Omicron and Alpha and Beta, COVID, SARS-CoV-2 these days. HIV also have many, many different strains. And we need to ask questions like, does the antibody works? Do this drug works on the strain? And so this is the kind of research that I'm doing. Now, I'm also looking at viral transcriptional control. And so when does the virus start to be transcriptionally activated? Are there differences between the different strains of HIV that would impact its transcriptional activity? I have a project on viral promoter that I will be talking about today. The third branch of my research program is on has an immunology component 
here I'm, I will be looking at the different immune pressure that is imposed on the viral genome and hence the virus evolved to escape these immune mechanisms. So today I'm going to be very sharply focused on non-subtype B HIV reservoirs. Great. So HIV as a virus. Um, HIV is of course a blood-borne pathogen that links me to the Center of Blood Research Group. So it is a retrovirus. It infects CD4 positive cells and it is the cause of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS. So without treatment, um, infected individuals would uh, will lose their CD4 cells, would acquire immunodeficiency, and it leads to death most of the time. So this is the HIV genome. HIV has a pretty simple genome. There are only nine genes encoding for 14 proteins. GAC is one of the genes, Pole is another gene. It gets cleaved by its own protease into multiple um, subproteins. Um, each has its own enzymatic function. Um, this is the envelope gene of HIV. So the GAC, pole, and ENT are the three essential genes in HIV. All the other genes are accessory, but it increases virulence. It helps the virus persist in, in a host cell. What is also interesting is that you can see that HIV use all frames, frame one and two and three. And so it's coding its genes in overlapping frames so that it can maximize the real estate use. For example, the ribosome would actually scan along an mRNA that has this part, translate GAC, and it would go backwards one base pair this is called a ribosomal frame shift, and it would start producing poles. So it would be reading in a different frame, just shifting one base backwards. So this is a, a mechanism that allows HIV to be extremely efficient in using the real estate because it only has a very, very small genome. Now, you can see that the red arrows here indicates drug targets, but None of the current FDA-approved drug targets actually eliminates HIV from our body. So there are drugs, antiretroviral drugs, that inhibits almost every step of the viral life cycle. There are even newer drug classes these days. The virus attach to a CD4 positive cells. It needs a co-receptor. In this case, in this picture, it's CCR5. It goes into a host cell, and most of the time, this is a CD4 T cell, CD4 positive T cell. It releases viral genome. Um, all of these are outdated. Actually, there are new research this year that um, indicates that this process actually happens inside the nucleus. But the viral RNA, which is packaged in the viral genome, so this is viral RNA in, in the viral particle, it gets reverse transcribed into viral DNA, and the viral DNA eventually integrates into the human genome, making the virus a part of the host cell. And it is because of this integration, we cannot get rid of HIV. Once a cell is infected, the virus becomes a part of the host cell. It survives and lives and dies with the host cell. So until the host cell die, the virus, um, the virus would not be eliminated. All of these steps intends to stop some part of the viral life cycle, but it never actually gets into the DNA, the host DNA and actually remove the virus um, integration. So it's irreversible. There are trials these days that um, looked at using CRISPR-Cas9 to remove, to um, cut, excise the virus, the viral genome from the host genome. Um, but you can already imagine that it's hard to find like which cell should we target. Um, the efficiency can be a problem. There can be off target issues. And so nothing really um, has allowed us to actually eliminate HIV from a, a person's body. And so far in the world, there are only three cases of HIV cure. Um, that is through intense chemotherapy because these are cancer patients. So what happened if a person stops HIV treatment? The HIV treatment stops the virus from replicating, but it doesn't remove the integrated copy of the viral genome. So what if a person 
before a person received antiretroviral treatment, virus replicate at a high level. So this is viral replication detected in blood. Once a person is put on any of the antiretroviral treatment that I showed earlier, viral replication drops, it went undetectable, but as soon as um, the treatment stops, viral replication resumes and it rebound. And so here, there's some very interesting picture about the HIV biology that, that we, we need to think about. So this indicates immediate viral activation, transcriptional activation, uh, transcriptional activation. And so what is the trigger? Is the virus just transcriptionally active all the time and is just waiting for the moment that the pressure is removed and then the viral transcription just immediately shows up and becomes detectable? Or is there a trigger that switch HIV from being transcriptionally silent to being transcriptionally active? How do we keep HIV transcriptionally silent so then we have, at least if we can't remove its genome, at least we keep it transcriptionally silent and we call that a functional cure? So the bottom line is, without the cure strategy, an infected individual must be put on lifelong daily anti-HIV regimen to um, prevent progression and transmission. So of course, with virus in the blood, the, um, there's a risk of transmitting to the next person. And again, so driving home this message, why is there no cure for HIV yet? Um, it is because HIV integrates into our genomes. And it compounds with the fact that HIV is actually very rare. An HIV infected cell is actually extremely rare in our body. So for example, here, all the, if all of these dots are CD4 positive T cells or CD4 positive cells, we are actually dealing with one in a million of CD4 positive T cells that will be positive for a replication competent HIV. And so if we need to find that one in a million CD4 T cells in order to eliminate the HIV reservoir, you can see that how we're actually looking at finding a needle in a haystack. HIV is also found in many different places in the body, in blood, in lymph node, in gut, in central nervous system. There are a lot of studies to look at whether the virus compartmentalize and become its own uh, little population within each of these compartments. Now, again, all infected cells must be eliminated in order to find a cure to HIV, but it's so difficult to find that one important cell that we should be making. And this is actually further compounded by a fascinating aspect of the HIV biology. When HIV in DNA genome into us, our genome, there are a lot of other ta times that the virus actually integrates defectively. It means that even though the, the viral particle encapsulate an intact viral genome, when it integrates or perhaps there, um, the mechanism is not well known. And so somewhere in the replication process, it creates a truncation. And so only a part of the genome was present. And so if you look at an infected individual, actually a lot of the times, even if we find an infected cell, there are only a trunk, uh, a truncated HIV genome. It's a junk HIV genome inside these infected cells. So what we need to actually identify is the holy grail, that one infected HIV cell that has the entire HIV genome. And so I modified my previous statement in order to eliminate HIV from a body, actually we need to find all cells that are infected with an intact HIV genome. And so it just makes finding the culprit even more difficult. So this is one of my uh, major um, accomplishment or work when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Reagan Institute in Boston. So how do we find out whether a viral genome is intact or not? We sequence them. And so I brought the sequencing techniques and the bioinformatics techniques that I've learned in Vancouver to the Reagan Institute in Boston. And I developed a deep sequencing technology um, or a deep sequencing assay and pipeline that study this particular aspect. 
In this assay, we looked at infected CD4 cells. We lyse all the DNA material, uh, the cells in a CD4 cell population. We get the total DNA. This person is infected with HIV. So some of the DNA materials would contain HIV genomes. Some would be intact, some would be defective. And I use a very brute force method. I limit and dilute it. So if I dilute it enough, one PCR well would contain only one single HIV genome. Some of them would be defective, some of them would be intact. Then I designed primers and probes. This is a seven hour reaction to one, in one single amplicon, amplify the entire HIV genome. So after the amplification is completed, I ran it on a gel, uh, I ran all of these reactions on a gel and find the positive ones and I sequence them. So if I obtain an HIV sequence, it can be either one of the intact ones or one of the defective ones. So how do I look at the sequence and find out whether a genome is intact or defective? Then I use my bioinformatics skills um, to look, uh, to, to develop a program to basically screen through the entire viral genome, the ACTGs, and look for mutations. Are there any truncations? Are there any mutations in uh, genome inversions, premature stop codons? If a viral genome does not have any of these defects, then it's classified as genome intact by the program. Then to actually validate this program, I then went to the lab and I grow out, I stimulate some HIV infected cells um, derived from donors. And I collect those viruses and sequence those viruses. Those viruses are defined to be because I can stimulate them and they can infect new cells. Those are the viruses that are replication combinant. Meaning that if I put them into the software, the software has to tell me that they are genome intact. And so this is how I validate a, a software, a bioinformatics software for, for um, HIV. So here's an output of this kind of assay. So in front of you, you see this is what we call a virogram. Each horizontal line in the diagram is a single molecule limiting diluted captured molecule from the PCR reaction that I showed you earlier. Um, there are 62 molecules in, um, on this diagram. Only the dark blue ones are genome intact. This, all of these um, 62 molecules on this slide is derived from a single individual at a single time point who is under suppressive active antiretroviral therapy, meaning that the virus is not actively replicating. This is the archived HIV that is um, stored in or uh, integrated in this person's CD4 cells. And so you can see that the, the, number, the level of genome antiviruses is actually very, very low. So the blue stack here is the culprit, is the thing, um, is the target that we want to find when we want to target HIV and try to eliminate HIV from um, this person's body. So I touched upon this entire um, concept of viral rebound. The diagram that I showed you earlier is during the suppressive antiretroviral treatment um, timeline where there are no active viral replication. There are nothing that can be detected in the blood, no viral genomes. But in a DNA, you still see the entire spectrum of intact to defective viruses that is somewhere in this time point. Then the important question then is, what are these viruses, viral genomes, doing in an infected cell? Are they transcriptionally active? Are they transcriptionally silent? Which one of them, even though we have a few intact viruses that you saw in the previous picture, which one of them would actually eventually become transcriptionally active enough that it would contribute to viral rebound? Or do all of them? contributes to viral rebound. Um, so this is my next topic of uh, investigation. But before that, I need to introduce one more um, complications to the HIV um, research. It is genetic diversity. HIV is also, so besides all of these things that you've just seen with, you know, truncations and DNA and RNA, HIV just have so many mutations that makes it one of the most genetically diverse virus in the world. Um, it's second to HCV. 
human pathogens. I, I wouldn't say it's the single, um, it's the genetic diversity in human pathogens. HIV is probably one of the, the higher, higher ones. There are many different HIV strains. We call them subtypes. Subtype B is the ones that are dominating the developed world. In North America, in South America, Europe, Australia, subtype B HIV is the cause of our epidemic. But in Africa, there are a lot of non-subtype B HIV that are circulating, and Africa has the highest disease burden. And non-subtype B HIV actually takes up over 90% of the worldwide HIV infections. However, a lot of our clinical trials are, of course, centered in developed world. And so if you ask any researcher, um, and most of the publications, if you search PubMed, most of the publications are still on subtype B. Um, a lot of clinical trials, it's like a 90% subtype B um, enrollment. And it is actually very difficult to find a clean non-subtype B um, trial on, for example, um, the, the latest um, HIV antiretroviral treatment class, for example. So this is actually something that I'm actively also trying to do. I'm still working on drug resistance on the side. All right. So with all of these different strains and our very biased focus on HIV subtype B, we need to ask how different are they? Um, does it even make, uh, make sense to spend effort uh, comparing them? And it's, this is, um, I love to show this picture. This is a very striking example showing that subtype B within itself, and this is the, GAC, the first gene, GAC pro, uh, this is the GAC protein. Within a single subtype across individuals, the GAC gene can be eight to 17% different in terms of amino acid sequence diversity. And so you're thinking about uh, cl close to a, one, um, one fifth of the protein being different. And somehow HIV is still functional or this protein is still functional. Um, if you look across subtype, it's even more striking. Subtype D and B are the closest neighbor in the HIV family tree. But even between subtype D and B, we are looking at 17 to 35% amino acid sequence variation. So it means that African HIV would one third of the GAC protein is going to be different from the GAC protein that we, we see in, in North America. So how does HIV still remains functional and still has the same biology? And here we need to ask ourselves, well, so the, genetically they're very different, but phenotypically and clinically, does it even matter? And yes, it does matter. For example, in the study, I've shown that subtype D is more aggressive. If we compare subtype A and subtype D in the same Ugandan population, so these are 500 people from the same Ugandan village. So they have similar genetic background. They went to the same clinic um, to receive their HIV care. Some of them are infected with A and some of them are infected with subtype D viruses. And you can see that subtype D is associated with a lower baseline CD4 count. Another study, this is not my study, but it, um, this person has shown that subtype A and D are significantly different in terms of survival. In subtype D HIV infections, these people progress to AIDS faster. Um, they lost their CD4 faster. They would pro um, progress to, more, to die much sooner than subtype A individuals. This is actually a mortality curve. And biology-wise, the two subtypes are also drastically different. Subtype D actually use a completely different co-receptor compared to subtype A. And so in this graph here, the higher um, the dots, the more likely the virus use um, a molecule called CCR5 as its entry co-receptor. And you can see that subtype D just doesn't even have that genotype. It, um, and it's well known that subtype D use a very uh, another receptor to go into the cell. So what it means was that in this particular viral subtype, it's very likely that it's infecting a completely different CD4 subpopulation um, 
we're talking about, for example, CD4, naive CD4 cells actually tends to not express as many CCR5 co-receptors. It means that perhaps, and there's a hypothesis, the subtype D is infecting more um, CD4 naive cells, whereas the other subtypes likes to infect um, the differentiated cells or, or the um, central memory and the um, effective memory cells, wh wh which are expressing the, um, the CCR5 co-receptor that it can binds to. Great. Another slide to show the differences between subtype. This is the NAV gene in across four subtypes. The NAV gene pulls down HLA molecules, so then the infected cell cannot signal a CD8 cytotoxic T cell that I'm infected, please kill me. So this is an HIV protein that has been known to pull down the presentation molecule HLA in order to evade immune killing or by CD8. And you can see that across subtypes, the effect of this pulling down of the HLA protein is actually different. So subtype B actually has the highest ability to downregulate HLA, whereas C and D seems to be, be a little lower. The same applies to CD4 downregulation and tetherine. These are two molecules that um, helps HIV in its life cycle or um, helps its immune invasion. And so you can see that all of these subtypes actually have a very different um, virulence um, pathology or the extent to how it evades immune system and the extent of how each molecule actually is active in its life cycle is actually very different. I'm going to talk about, and in, in the last half of the presentation, I'm going to hone into a very specific study and talk about something that I've presented just a month ago in um, an HIV conference called CROI. Um, everything is virtual this year, so we, we're still presenting this virtually. But here in the study, my lab looked at a very specific feature in the HIV promoter. So. The HIV virus is driven, um, the transcription is driven by a viral promoter that has multiple transcription factor binding sites. And we all know that, do I have a figure? I don't have a figure. So we all know that in a promoter, there are um, transcription factor binding sites that would triggers or initiates transcription event. Um, HIV has canonically two NF kappa B binding motifs in its viral promoter. NF-kappa B is one of the key class of transcription factor that drives HIV transcription activation, at least according to what is known right now. And so what I hypothesize in the study is because HIV has a very high mutation rate and I've touched upon that the virus just mutates so fast that um, there are all these point mutations, the strains are all over the place in the world. Um, they, they all have different phenotypes. So with this high mutation rate, no one really has looked at the viral promoter and see how the promoter's genotype has changed within a person and across subtypes. And so this is a very preliminary look at the viral promoter and ask, so just how many NF-kappa B binding sites are there? With this high HIV mutation rate, would the mutation actually removed, um, eliminated some of these NF-kappa B binding sites? Or is it always conserved and retained in across subtypes in, in a different um, HIV genomes. We've also talked about genome intact and defective proviruses. So with the truncated fossil junk proviruses in a person's system, does the viral promoter, um, is it the same as the ones that are genome intact that has the po possibility or likelihood to be reactivated? So these are the few things that we are comparing. Here's a deeper look at the HIV viral promoter. You can see a list of features that is in a textbook. This is from a textbook. Um, so the HIV promoter has NF-kappa B sites. There's another transcription factor called SP1. There's TCF1 alpha. So all of these um, are canonical HIV promoter um, features. If we hone into NF-kappa B, 
NF-kappa-B DNA binding motifs are very well um, classified or studied. There are three canonical motifs called H, C, and F. Um, they have very specific sequences. And so it's very well known that in subtype B, there are two NF-kappa-B binding sites, and the binding sites are called H. In subtype C, though, there are two plus another one. This C site differs in genotype compared to the H site, but it still binds. However, because HIV does all of these point mutations, the natural question is, with all of these point mutations, if there's a point mutation in the H site, does it mean the NF-kappa B binds or does it mean that it binds to less of an affinity? And so there are previous human studies, not HIV studies, that look at these point mutations. And there, um, so there are groups that develop algorithms to predict with wet lab data, how does mutation impact NF-kappa B binding? And so according to one of these algorithms, and the algorithm is written here, you can see that if you give each sequence, so the ACTGs, if you identify an, um, a sequence and you give it a score based on this particular algorithm, it actually has a positive correlation to the binding affinity score. The binding affinity is the um, EMSA score. So, and this specifically look at the NF-kappa B P50 homodimer. So you can see that with a compute uh, with a mathematical algorithm, you can actually predict binding affinity. And so with impl by implementing this particular algorithm, we were able to screen the promoter sequences that we have. Um, we, we do a lot of HIV sequencing. So I go back to my, our HIV sequences and I retrieve all the promoters. And I asked, are the subtypes different? Uh, for, for this particular study, I actually download it from a public database first. And so I compare across subtypes. Um, in the first picture, I've already shown you that subtype B and C have very different promoters. Subtype C had three and subtype B had two um, sites. And you can see that in this figure, A, B, and D are quite similar to each other. Blue means it has two H site, two H, zero C, and zero F site. Subtype C the um, has a lot of purple. It has two H, one C, and zero F. So most of subtype C has the three binding site phenotype, uh, genotype. But there are also the ones that are not. And so does it mean that this virus is more easily uh, or more difficult to reactivate because it has less site? But what about binding affinity? And so in the next slide, um, oh, um, also there's another subtype called AE. There is only one binding site in this um, virus. And so in this next slide, then we incorporate the binding affinity data. We found, uh, the, oh, sorry, the next slide of binding affinity data. Here, we actually look at just the point mutation impact. If we also count the point mutations, would it actually make a difference? And so here, this is actually interesting because it's in subtype C, counting the point mutation and even counting the point mutation, it still has the highest median count of NF-kappa B binding motifs. But because we are counting the point mutations, instead of only having three sites, we now have 10 median sites in subtype C. So subtype C seems to be to, to have the most, um, the highest counts of uh, NF-kappa B binding sites. Now here we look at binding affinities. Subtype B seems to have the highest binding affinity, where subtype C seems to be lower. So then the, the, the question becomes, is the count more important or is the binding affinity more important? Before we can um, even answer uh, address this question, I saw that AE has a very, very much lower binding affinity. And if you remember from our previous um, slide. AE had nine here and only one canonical binding sites here. And so I just found AE to be particularly curious. Does it probably, um, it has the lowest count and the lowest binding affinity. Does it mean that it is the most difficult to reactivate AE and does AE viral infected individuals um, 
have the lowest amount of viral transcription activity in their system. That is for future studies. Um, I actually, after I presented this in the international conference, um, I was approached by a collaborator who, who told me, oh yeah, we have some AE um, virus, uh, AE samples from donors and they're extremely difficult to reactivate. Maybe that is why. And so um, we are trying to set up a, a different a collaboration over there. So here is um, a slide that shows us the H genotype was actually the most commonly observed motif. And so there, there's a reason why this is the most studied and have capitally binding motif, so H motif. And so the bottom line is, are the subtypes different? Yes, the subtypes are very different. The promoters are extremely different and it actually points to perhaps they have a different biology, a di di different tendency likelihood to become reactivated. Then, this is the last part, within a single person, we sampled multiple HIV genomes from a single person. Some of these genomes are defective and the very rare ones are intact. And I want to ask, do the intact genomes have, because the intact genomes would actually evolve and if it's too active, it might actually lyse the cells and the, and the virus would die, uh, sorry, and the host infected cell would die. So my question is, I thought, I thought, and uh, I kind of spilled the beans that antiviruses would probably have a weaker promoter compared to defective virus because the defective viruses are just fossils and they sit there and do nothing. And so I thought that the antiviruses would have a weaker promoter to, to make them persist to, so that they are um, selected, so they, they actually survive the selection pressure game. So here we sequenced, um, 600 genomes from 15 donors, over 100 genomes from nine donors in D um, and then B and then AE. You can see that the promoter genotypes per person and on the X axis, these are donor IDs. Each person had a very different promoter genotype. Um, these are the promoter genotypes for intact genomes. And the quick summary here is that even within the single subtype, so subtype B, not everyone had two ages. There are one individual that only had one age. And if you look at the different genome categories, um, intact viruses are not actually different from other defective viruses. So truncations, um, there are other, you know, premature stop codons. Intact viral promoters are actually not different from the other genome class. So this is actually against my prediction. I thought intact genomes would have a weaker promoter, but actually it, they, they don't, um, except for a class called hypermutations. So this class of viral genomes had an impact by um, our host defensive proteins, and our host defensive proteins actually introduce a lot of mutations in a viral genome, causing hypermutations. But even with a host proteins that is causing a massive amount of mutations in HIV genome, this hypermutated genomes still had nf kappa B binding sites. So I just found it really um, interesting that even with a huge amount of mutation introduced into the viral genome, it did not lose all of its promoter um, transcription factor binding sites. And so that actually got into it. So this is a completely different assay that I've developed. This is a full length viral transcript sequencing assay that I call TransSeq. Um, I brought up this slide because these hypermutated viral genomes actually were detectable as a viral transcripts that are spliced. So these are spliced donor and acceptor sites. And even though it's heavily hypermutated, it still gets spliced and it has a very clean splice site. And so this is, and because we now know that it has an active promoter with some, but not all, all of the nf kappa B binding sites, it's able to produce transcripts. And so this points to the question of, actually the defective viruses are not just fossils and doing nothing. I mean, the genome intact viruses are the culprit for the next round of infections, but the defective viruses are actually also transcribing. They, they seem to be um, contributing to something in a cell, 
and it may or may not be contributing to you know inflammation inflammation continuous inflammation and so these are all um, topics that needs further study but at least we know that the defective viruses are actually not doing nothing okay so um the bottom line then i went and compare um, within individuals so all of these are subtype b infected donors and within each donor we actually found different counts of nf kappa b binding sites and they are of different affinities for example donor 18 had a lower count of nf kappa b binding site but a higher affinity whereas this person has a lower affinity but a higher count um, I would be interested to go into a clinical cohort or a clinical trial to see whether these individuals, uh, which aspect is more important? Is the count more important or is the score more important? Um, can I make a, a combined algorithm to weight both the score and the count, which has a higher weight? Um, all of these are things that um, are planned for the future. And so um, question two, my hypothesis is the antigen defective viral genome promoters are different and it's not, they're not different except for the hypermute um, class of genomes. All right, so this concludes my presentation. The take home message, if you have to remember one thing from today is that there are many different HIV subtypes and they all have very different promoters. They all have very different genotypes. They might have different likelihood of reactivation. They're infecting different cells. Um, they, they have different immune evasion capabilities. And so strains is definitely um, an important aspect, I think, in virology, in, in the study of viruses. So in the future, um, immediate future, I will look at, um, I am looking at different promoter features. I'm collaborating with um, the, uh, the, actually the collaborators from Montreal, and he would be um, looking at the subtype AE promoters and the reactivation likelihood. And I would also like to go into clinical trials and look at time to rebound and whether these different subtypes respond differently to latency reversal chemicals. So with this, I would like to thank everyone in my lab. Um, my lab currently has five people and um, there are three students and two technicians. They're extremely, extremely nice, um, very helpful. I'm very ha happy and grateful to have them. I want to uh, thank my faculty mentor, Dr. Brad Jones. Brad is also from Canada. He's from the University of Toronto. And um, Brad has been extremely nice to me and have been instrumental in my career. Um, and of course, all of my collaborators from the US, from Canada, and from around the world. Um, and of course, all of our study participants and my funding support, um, I'm funded by the NIH mostly. And finally, I'm hiring. <laughs> I, um, so if anyone is interested in working in Manhattan, um, I'm hiring at all levels. Um, I'm hiring research assistant one, um, postdoctoral fellow, and a staff scientist. Um, so if anyone is interested in virology, molecular epidemiology, or viral bioinformatics, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gwen. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, which, which I don't know if you can read yourself, but I'll read them to you. So the first one is, so how come CD4 positive cells are declining so fast in HIV infected people when only a few cells have the intact genome for HIV? Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting, um, very important question actually. So there is a decay phase in the infection. So initially when it's uncontrolled infection, when there is no antiretroviral treatment applied to the system, an infected person actually have around 1,000, not, it's, still, it's still not high, but around 1,000 to 10,000 infected, productively infected CD4 cells in the system. And so basically it goes into the question of how cells die, how CD4 cells die in an HIV infection, how many of them died because of direct viral um, pathological effect, cytopathic effects? How many of them died because of bystander inflammation, massive inflammation e events? And so this 
there's a balance there and it, the, the answer is all of them. So a lot of, so there are a portion of CD4 cells that did not die because of a massive uh, cytopathic effect. But when there is an uncontrolled infection, these um, newly released viral particles would go out and infect the other CD4 cells. And so AIDS is a progression. Um, it takes a couple of years, one to two years, to, for a person to completely have lost all of the CD4. So you can imagine that you only have a subpopulation of CD4s that are infected, but then the, the, the infected cells do not get antiviral treatment control and they produce a lot of viral particles and then it infects new cells. And then the entire population just kind of stepwise goes down. I hope I answered your question. Ravi, right? I'm yeah. looking at the chat now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, you have another question in the chat box related to what genotype was your control for your WGS PCR? And do you think that different genotypes will have different PCR efficiencies and thus impact your findings? Thank you. This is actually an extremely important question. Yes. Um, so when I developed this particular assay, my genotype, um, and I assume that you're talking about the different subtypes. Um, and, and of course, there are subgenotypes within a subtype. Um, so when I developed this assay, I used subtype B. When I moved to a different strain um, with the uh, full genome PCR, I always validate the sensitivity. So I use the same PCR primers and probes. Um, I use short probe methods, long methods, uh, with you know all of these long amplicon, short amplicon methods would have different efficiencies. And so I basically had to validate the same primers and probes across the subtypes every time I switch to a different subtype, establish a sensitivity value, and then go back and say, yes, um, I would be able to take this. Now, not, no PCR method, including P qPCR, um, BioRed DDPCR, none of these methods are 100% foolproof of genetic diversity. Um, even in actually, even in the SARS-CoV-2 world, the Omicron actually had one um, binding fell out in the qPCR amplicons. And so we're dealing with these constant viral evolutions and a PCR that is uh, sequence specific, virus sequence specific, always have this as a limitation, I think. And so the, the best we can do is to look and be very careful um, to control the sensitivity values. Thanks very much, Gwen. Um, I see the Dr. Prizedale's put his camera on, which must mean he has a question. Hello. Hi. Good guest, Dana. Thank you. A terrific talk, one of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I was. I have a couple of little questions, not exactly related questions either. Uh, I was curious if the um, affinities that you were estimating using your algorithm are consistent with the intracellular concentration of the ligands that you are measuring. Wow. That is extremely, extremely important. Um, probably not. These are all on a plate assays. Right. So exactly. Um, I think this is actually very important. Um, I have not looked into this and uh, I think this is a good, um, good question. I should probably look into it. I don't even know what the intercellular concentration is. Um, and in you know, NFCAP, we have many different um, isoforms. Um, there's the rel A, rel B. This particular affinity prediction is only on P50 homodimers. And so I'm missing all the rest of the NF kappa B. But then how, um, there are not also not a lot of studies out there that looks at each of these combination with the permutations in a DNA to look at binding affinities. And so- You can get some guesses though, regarding the intracellular concentrations of these uh, respective ligands and to get a clue as to whether or not you're predictions are getting close. I, I see. I, yeah, so it's, anyhow, extremely interesting parameters that you're measuring and probably good predictors of what might be going on there. I was also curious whether the different strains that you're measuring respond different, differently to the combination uh, retroviral therapies and, and whether rebounds might be different as well. Thanks for asking this question. This is actually one of my, my 
most um, biggest research passion. So the to the first question, um, this is actually work that I've done in Vancouver. So in Vancouver with Dr. Richard Harrigan, I was comparing whether subtype A and B and C and D are all responding to antiretroviral viral therapy, but I can only do A and D head to head comparison because they're from the same community. Um, the answer is no. Antiviral viral therapy is such a big slash hammer. It just like shuts down everything, especially with the combination therapy effect. It is just so potent that all subtypes, regardless of which subtype respond to it, um, to lead to a time to suppression within three months most in most people. Um, the resistance, if a person eventually develop resistance because of adherence issues, the resistant mutation pathways may be different. Hmm. And is, is there any evidence that the different strains may give rise even during during CART therapy, is there any evidence that the different strains may give a rise to the different um, inflammatory uh, issues that these that these people uh, undergo, such as thrombotic episodes and so on? So um, it's uh, HIV chronic inflammation is definitely associated with um, increased myocardial events. So the definite, but there are actually very few had to have studies that actually compare two subtypes. From the ones that I know, um, there's, there's a collaborator at UCSF, Peter Hunt, studies a lot of this. He did not see any differences. And you know, for a clinical study like this to happen, you need to have two subtypes that is co-circulating in a community where people are comparable in terms of their background genetics, their um, healthcare structures, their access to antiviral therapy. Um, and we have access to a very um, rare Ugandan community where this is happening and where we have subtype A and D head to head comparisons. We have not seen anything, but I think this is something that is very interesting that I think maybe it's the next grant. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah. No, thank that's, you. That's terrific. Thanks for the answer. Yeah, thanks for the ideas too. There's actually a lot of calls from the NIH to study HIV and um, ca cardiac. Uh, pathology. And so uh, I was actually involved in something earlier too. Cool. Thanks for the question. Sorry, I'm, I'm muted. That's not very helpful. Um, so if there are other questions, you could either put them in the chat box or you could raise your hand and just ask your question. Anybody have any, any other questions? Okay, I don't actually see any hands going up, Gwen. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll just say thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, and we'd uh, we happily have you. Uh, it's nice to know that you're you're launched your career in New York, and and it's all going well. So thank you very much. Thank you. I see Sabrina saying hi. Hi, Sabrina. Thank you so much, Dana, for inviting. You're very Thanks welcome. Very. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you for your questions. Take care. Bye. Take care. I hope to see you all again.